Good evening, I'm Christiana Manpour and welcome to the program. We've come to Abu Dhabi this week to explore a range of issues facing the Persian Gulf states. Oil wealth and new energy, geopolitics, dynamic modern cities rising from the desert. But no issue raises as much passion and exposes so many fault lines coursing through Arab societies as the role of women. A recent study by the World Economic Forum found women in the Middle East lagging far behind other regions in terms of political empowerment and economic opportunity. And that is what's choking the pace of development in the Arab world, a subject for both our guests, pioneers in the Persian Gulf. Rola Dashti, a US-trained economist, recently was among the first women elected to the Kuwaiti parliament. And also Sheikha Lubna, Minister of Foreign Trade here in the United Arab Emirates. She's the first female cabinet member in the UAE. And they join me now. Welcome to you both. Let me start with you, Sheikha Lubna, since we are in the UAE. You are the first ever female minister of an oil-rich province, of an oil-rich state. How did this come about? How did you become the first female minister here? Um, it was in November 2004, and I got a call from the government. I was in Tunisia at that time, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the question came about, would you know, the government ask you a call upon you to join the cabinet? And I responded, let me call my mother. <laughs> let me call my, my mother. mother and ask her. And there was silence on the other side. I bet there For was. For me, it was a shock uh, to start with. But um, to lead a, 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 um, a ministry such as economy um, was quite frightening. Um, it's not uh, the typical mandate or portfolio for a woman minister um, usually. Uh, Why did they the, give it to you? I have a good record track, uh, track record when it comes to working in technology and development with any government as well as the, in the port operation in Dubai. Yeah. Uh, so the idea was to give it to someone who's accountable in terms of delivery and, and is a mandate, but it's also um, a, a role model to push further for the women here. And um, now you're foreign trade minister. I'm minister of foreign trade, yes. Let me ask you, Rola, you are amongst a very, very small group of women in the Kuwaiti parliament. Yes. How was that? I mean, we know that women got their vote only about four years ago, right, 2005. But it was only this last May that you actually entered parliament. There was a big struggle to get in. No question about it. It's a big struggle. The Kuwaiti society is on a transformational stage. And people were frustrated and they wanted a change to a better life. Uh, and every time you speak about change, but they don't act towards change. In the election of 2009, they thought we need to act on a change and change will come about with women. And women, we, the society decided that women should contribute to the change process, should be partner in the future of the country and make a say in the future of the country. Well, we have some pictures. We have one on your victory night when you actually won, uh, won your seat in parliament. Tell me about how difficult it was. There you are being embraced and the uh, It's a joy fist. of a life. Uh, uh, sorry? It's a joy of a lifetime. Joy of your lifetime. Yes. How difficult was it, though? Because it took four years for them to actually agree to let women from getting the vote to actually join the political process. It's not, it wasn't easy. It was, we went through, I, I ran three times. And we wanted to tell society that we are ready. We can contribute. We can be part of the decision and politics. And we had to do a platform. But our platform was the future. We were hopeful to the people. We brought an agenda that is realistic, but we are determinist. And we, we spoke about the future, not about the past. The past, we kept telling them with all this frustration, with all the problems we had with it, we learned from it. But let's move with the past, the future, and we can work it together for a better future. And this is where it triggered to the people because we, we went and gave them the hope and we had the track record of accomplishing things. As Lubna was just saying, it's just like people want to deliver, to hear a positive message, but also that people are accountable and they have a track record of accountability and deliverability for a better future. And women was part of this. Let me, I'll get, I'll get to accountability in the moment, but the whole idea of, of making it in this, of all male dominated societies, perhaps the last bastion where it's so difficult for women to break through. And you were promoted, particularly during the time of the Ports Authority, when you, and the, and the men, I understand, were very, very negative about your promotion. 
the promotion in terms of the position itself, um, not really because I had worked as a technologist before. Um, you would uh, a very typical uh, structure or culture within the Emirates that you'd see the government itself uh, driving the movement of women. Um, by instating them in particular jobs or, or positions. And the idea of that is really to um, give an example, and then once you work out so the delivery itself, it reinstates the, gov the government's uh, uh, um, understanding for mm. this, but it gives the confidence for the people that this is the right thing to yeah. do. Yeah, and, and one of your big international mm. events was just a few years ago when you were head of the Dubai ports, and there was this whole issue of of, of buying into the U.S. ports, the US ports yeah. and the post 9-11 uh, sentiments in the United States were not very uh, conducive to that. Tell us what happened then. Um, what it was is uh, the, the background of working as a technologist in Dubai ports um, helped a great deal in going back to the U.S. Uh, post um, uh, Dubai, uh, Dubai ports fewer. The idea was um, uh, from our side was actually to put a face to the UAE uh, in, in some prospects. Um, what we learned from that, most people think it's a, it was a, a, a loss a battle for us, but it's not. We actually learned a great deal from it. One, we didn't realize um, how much we were known as a brand, the United Arab Emirates or Dubai per se. Mm -hmm. And the idea of understanding that me meant that we really have to promote um, the country itself and the work, uh, what we <coughs> and the work that we do. United Arab Emirates is the largest trading partner for the U.S. in the Middle East, surpassing 14 billion U.S. dollars, yet we don't have a face of the UAE uh, in the States. So the idea was more of a, a diplomacy envoy to meet with people, to speak, to, to be on, on programs, and to say that this is a country that's quite liberal, it's very open, um, we are toward an uh, open economy. So the idea of having a woman to speak in the U.S. at that time. Was uh, a great selling point for, absolutely, for the UAE. Absolutely. Um, in terms of sort of a similar situation in, in Kuwait, you also, and your the three other women MPs, had quite a lot of resistance from the more hardline, the more conservative Islamists in the Kuwaiti parliament. No question. And you've just, I think, had to battle the whole idea of whether you should wear a headscarf in Parliament or not. No question about it. It's, you see, we, by us getting to the Parliament, it's a social change that happened to the society. As we watch you there in, in Parliament and yeah. some of your other, other members there. Go ahead. It's, uh, the, that social change is, is deep-rooted and some people felt, you know, this is too fast and uh, women should, they didn't settle that role of women in public life and private life. So a lot of some of the MPs, conservative radical Islamists, they think that the role of women should be in the private sphere and that's it. And contributing to the public life is something, not her business of it. And we did the transformation change when we were uh, campaigning. Because at the beginning, say, how women can go and campaign? Uh, because as, as you know, in Kuwait, we do have like what we call diwaniyas. And these are men gatherings, purely men, only men g goes in them. And these where the candidates go to see the uh, voters and speak, and they are very influential, the diwaniyas. And now when we were running, we were going to these diwaniyas as candidates. And this is what's the beauty about it, because the, the society, the male diwaniyas, were welcoming women to come as, as a candidate and hearing from, from them as a candidate and discussing with them. Uh, they were shocked and we were invited and sometimes I used to get phone calls because there were lots of diwaniyas, thousands of diwaniyas and you cannot get to them. And people will call you and say, you didn't pass by us. You didn't pass by us. And so there was a sense that they wanted to see the women candidates. They the wanted women to see ca women mm -hmm. candidates. And this is to tell society, yes, we are conservative society, but we are open. Mm -hmm. We are open to that. And this is what frightened uh, the radical Islamists because they wanted to take the role of women just in the public life. And we said, listen, we are accepted by society. The society is not like this. And we can move forward in developing our nation. One of the visuals of conservatism or moderate, moderate or liberal is the, is the veil. Now, you don't wear it. And in fact, you got a ruling from the court that you didn't have to wear it in parliament. You, on the other hand, do wear a hijab. Yeah. And yet the UAE is, is considered a lot more liberal and moderate than even Kuwait. Because the veil itself is more of a stigma in the stereotyping in the States or in the Western uh, uh, countries, but in general it's not. Are you wearing uh, it by choice? Yes. And uh, uh, for us, it's a choice for women to wear it or not to wear it. So you'd see a lot of young women wearing it or not wearing it. 
But what I'm saying is this doesn't block my thinking. It doesn't block my future. Um, it, it's the same as you go to India. They have women astronauts that went to, to, to space and yet they wear saris. Mm -hmm. So the idea is the whatever you have on as a clothes, it's got nothing to do with what you're actually striving for in your life. But, but like you said, it should be more of a choice given uh, rather than imposed. Um, uh, for us, it, it, it makes no difference. On the contrary, I, I do believe culturally in the Emirates, starting the movement of women um, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, being covered encouraged the position of women to be okay because you're not changing what you look like or what you're dressed uh, uh, yeah. is all about. You are actually uh, making milestones and the change how the society looks at you for your achievement.